COVID-19 has brought lifestyle changes and public health worries. Another challenge, educating our children. What will this new school year look like? Coming up for discussion on living in the new normal. Hello, I'm Marcia Cavanaugh, and thanks for joining us for this latest episode of our series, Living in the New Normal, which is taking a look at how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting our everyday lives. And this half hour, educating our children. How do we make sure our kids are going to receive quality instruction in this new school year? Well, joining us to explain what's being planned, Louisiana State Superintendent of Education, Dr. Cade Brumley, New Schools for New Orleans CEO Patrick Dobard, and Louisiana's 2020 Teacher of the Year, Chris Deere. And I want to thank all of you guys for joining us because this is just really an important conversation. People are concerned, certainly, about having their children educated, which we all know is just such an important thing. But we need to keep everybody safe, the students, the teachers, the administration. So, Dr. Brumley, I'm going to go to you first. Um, the state has issued some policies and guidelines. How are you guys first? How are you guys getting your guidance? What's, deter what's helping to determine what the policies are going to be? So this is uncharted territory for everyone. Uh, and then we know it's going to take an all hands on deck approach to be able to serve our children uh, in this in this new way and, and new time. Uh, we at the Department of Education never claimed to be experts on this virus, but we are smart enough to know uh, that we can partner with experts in the medical community to help us make decisions. And so we partnered with health organizations such as the Louisiana Department of Health, uh, Ochsner Hospital, Children's Hospital, Tulane Medical Center, uh, and we've been working hand in hand collaboratively with those organizations to set forward minimum standards for health and safety that school systems across the state will have to employ if they're going to open up uh, for the upcoming school year. Describe what some of those minimum standards are. Yeah, so the way that we approach that work is we designed the standards based on the phase that the state might be in in terms of the virus. So, for instance, if we're in phase two, we have a specific set of standards that have to be met around group size, uh, amount of students who can be on a school bus, um, sanitation, uh, a number of different things. If that uh, phase of state government goes to back to phase one, we would have more restrictions. Mm -hmm. If we move to phase three, we would have less restrictions. And so we set it up in that way uh, that systems can toggle back and forth with a strategic plan on how to approach education based on the phase of the virus. So um, students, as I understand it, second and under, they're not going to be, if they're going to do in-person, in-school learning, they don't have to wear masks. It's third and above. Is that correct? Well, so you have to remember, we set minimum state standards. So each local educational agency, each, each parish, um, they can determine, each school system rather, they can determine if they want to be more aggressive with the standards, but they certainly can't be less aggressive. So the state policy called for uh, students who are in grades pre-K through two, they may wear a face covering, but it's not mandated. The reason we didn't mandate that, we had uh, conversations about this, and we did have some concerns brought to us that maybe students in younger grades, uh, having that face covering on their face, it might uh, cause them to touch their mouth or their nose more. And further, uh, we heard concerns from our educators around language development. Kids in that early age are learning how to make sounds with their lips and their tongue, and if that face is covered, that might have been a problem. But what we did say uh, is students in grades three and above, as well as all adults in the building, must wear a face covering. And certainly, Marcia, uh, certain systems, and rightfully so, dependent on the amount of community spread uh, in their neighborhood, and their community, are, are being uh, more aggressive uh, to the minimum state standards. Now, school opening also is kind of is varied um, just across the state here, really in the metro area. Some earlier August, some middle August, some waiting for in-class, if they have any at all, until uh, after, or after Labor Day. But if kids are in, in school, um, social distancing is something that we have to do outside of school, just in everyday life right now. How are you going to manage that with kids in class? Or is it going to be recess? What about lunch? 
Well, it, it's certainly dependent on the setting, uh, and it's and it's obviously dependent on the age of the child. So it's more of a challenge probably to social distance four-year-olds in a pre-K setting than it might be to distance uh, juniors in a U.S. history course. Mm -hmm. And so what we said, uh, for elementary classrooms, we're asking systems to build static groups, uh, pods, cohorts of students, and they stay with that same group of children throughout the entire day and do not intermingle with other students. However, as you move up in grades, say high school, for instance, where students have to change classes uh, because they need certain credits. Uh, if that is taking place and they do have to intermingle, we're asking for six feet of, of space in between those students to all extents possible throughout the school day. I'm going to bring up a question right now that we received from one of our viewers who is a teacher out of St. Tammany Parish, and this is from Kara. If there's a single exposure in one class, would all over 100 of my students across several classes need to be quarantined? What, what are schools expected to do if a COVID-19 case pops up? So, so that's not necessarily the case that you would have to quarantine over 100 students because you had a single exposure. Uh, we are working hand in hand with Louisiana Department of Health. We are issuing a set of uh, guidelines in terms of some of the most common situations we expect to see. If a student uh, is symptomatic, if a student is uh, positive for a case, or the same for an adult, uh, you, you do not necessarily have to quarantine 100 students because one student throughout the day uh, tested positive uh, or was symptomatic. And we, we are just asking our educators to work hand in hand with the leaders in their own systems who are then working hand in hand with their health officials to make those decisions. We have uh, provided resources for that. We will continue to provide more guidance for that. But local decision making is really going to matter right now. Local leadership is really going to matter. And so we're asking that everyone please have a ton of grace uh, patients and give a ton of support to our educators in the field right now because they are working through times unlike they've ever seen. Unlike, really. That is absolutely so true. Patrick Dobard, let me bring you in on this conversation. You guys work very closely with Orleans Parish with the, the charter schools. Now, Orleans Parish has set its policies and guidelines and also how it's going to handle its school year. Um, what do you, how, are the, how are the charter schools handling this? Because the charter schools also have they have the guidelines, but they can also make their own decisions. Yeah, the, the charters in New Orleans, they, they're, they're functioning and handling much like traditional public schools all around the state. So they regularly meet with the superintendent of Orleans Parish, um, Henderson Lewis. They regularly meet with his team uh, to, to talk about what each other is doing, to figure out what's best for each individual network. But at the end of the day, they, they continue to work collaboratively. They work together. And it, it really functions not much differently than a traditional school district. You just have more individuals at the table because you have more networks um, that, that, that folks are responsible for. You know, the charter schools, because kids don't necessarily go to a school in their neighborhood, some kids in, in Orleans particularly go and cross town to get to their school. You guys are, you know, are dependent upon many families are transportation, bus transportation. So what's going to be the approach for bus transportation, uh, transportation, getting kids to schools? How many kids can we put the bus? Do we set them far apart? How is that going to work? It, it's going to work the same way that um, Superintendent Brumley just mentioned. And so depending on the phase that we're in, uh, if you're in phase two, there is a certain number of kids that can be on the bus at a time. And so they're going to have to think about, you know, staggering bus routes. Uh, a lot of schools, as you know, in New Orleans, they're going to do distance learning until at least Labor Day to be able to evaluate what the situation is. And so, again, just like any other district around the state, it'll be dependent upon the phase. And then you have to follow uh, at least to the minimum standard. Um, and you hope that, that you keep in mind that we want to constantly work towards maximum safety for, for students and, and, and essential staff and all staff. Right. right. You guys uh, at New Schools for New, York, New, uh, New Orleans, you guys work very closely with parents, too. You get a lot of parental input. What are you hearing from parents? about entering into this new school year? Well, one of the biggest things we're hearing I mean, from parents, and we have teachers as well that we interact a lot with, and, and a lot of our teachers are parents as well, it's, it's a matter of what we're hearing most is folks wanting to understand just like the safety for when you have to be um, in, in person learning mm -hmm. uh, and making certain that everything's being done to, to maximize the amount of safety. And, and in New Orleans in particular, where in our public schools, we have such a high percentage of, of African-American students uh, and, 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 and students that come out of poverty, the concern is a lot of their extended families and individuals and in, in, in families in New Orleans have experienced in a trauma 
via COVID. So they know of a grandmother or or, a relative that has passed away from this. And so while this is still a a fairly new um, virus, the uncertainties are the things that parents are seeking assurances on. And it's tricky because you have the CDC guidance, you have the guidance that the state has been putting out, and then everything is pushed down into the local level. And what we're trying to do is make sure that parents are hearing from the school leaders to ensure that their concerns around safety and how they're thinking about it systemically is is, is addressed. And so th- those are like some of the biggest things that we're hearing from parents um, on a consistent basis. So, of course, we're concerned about kids across the board, all learners, all of our young learners, um, and also for special needs uh, uh, children. And I have a question here from uh, a teacher in Orleans Parish, one of our viewers. As a special ed teacher, how are we to address or enforce the need for students to wear masks? Would there be an exception for students with noncompliance issues issues or learning disabilities. What kind of guidance are schools being given for that, Patrick? Yeah, now I, I talk with um, and, and talk regularly with special education experts in the city. And m- one of the main things they continue to stress is that that each child and parent will be engaged as they are normally um, on what's best for those individual children um, regarding the circumstances. And so if you have an individualized, as these kids would have an individualized education plan, then they'll sit with the, the staff, with the teachers, with the administration and the parents to figure out what's best for a child. So if a child has a disability where wearing a mask could be something that's detrimental to them, they'll talk about how to make that work, how to provide safety for the instructor, how to provide safety for others, while also meeting the needs of the child. And so all of these things will be um, it should be addressed on a case-by-case basis. All right. So, as you said, addressed as a, on a case-by-case basis. I mean, this is all just really a learning curve, really, across across the board for everybody and how we handle education in this new year, and certainly for teachers, too. Um, Chris, let's go over to you, our 2020 uh, Louisiana Teacher of the Year, and congratulations to you on that. Um, you had been in the St. Bernard system at Chalmette High. Now you're going to go over to Ben Franklin for this new school year. But you're an educator. You're a teacher. You're there, used to being in the classroom, you know, dealing with kids one-to-one. What are you hearing from your fellow educators? What are their concerns? Um, what do they feel about this approaching new year? Well, first, uh, thank you for that. Congratulations. And also, uh, thank you for having me. I think it's incredibly important to have teachers in these discussions because this is our passion. This is, you know, this is our lives. And I think that across the um, New Orleans area and across the state, teachers are prepping and in, in very different ways. They're preparing different strategies and practices to try to, uh, like Mr. Uh, Dobart said, meet students where they are. are You know, some schools are going back hybrid and some virtually. Uh, Regardless of that, teachers are going to have to teach virtual, virtual learning. And I think that's going to be incredibly challenging for teachers because we are used to being in the classroom and that's where our expertise is. We're, We're used to that connection. So trying to replicate that connection to a digital platform is incredibly challenging. Mm. And I think that's where a lot of teachers have concerns. How are we gonna meet the needs of certain populations? How are we gonna uh, meet the needs of students with disabilities Mm -hmm. or students that uh, require accommodations? Or our EL, our English language learners, how are we going to um, try to meet every single student where they're at when that's already somewhat of a struggle in the classroom to do that outside of the classroom? I think that's um, where teachers are prepping uh, preparing for this new school year at the moment. Are teachers voicing concerns about, you know, their own personal safety too, concerned about actually going into the classroom or into a school building? Teachers are very concerned about that. I, I can honestly say that um, teachers definitely, in, in general, they, they do put their lives on the line for education and they, they do a lot of things that, um, you know, require a lot of physical and mental uh, stress and whatnot. I would say that I think going back into the classroom, teachers have a concern because they're not only putting themselves on the line, but if they were to contract the virus and go home or spread it to the community, then they could potentially be endangering uh, other people as well. And if you do that, then you you have some students that could lose family members or can lose their support structure. So teachers are incredibly concerned, not just for their safety, but for the safety of the community as well. Are teachers um, getting some assistance in doing this virtual instruction, or are you guys being briefed at all about how to best do this? I know the Louisiana Department of Education is uh, briefing teachers throughout the state, and I know other districts are as well. 
Uh, one of the challenges is that it's not just new for teachers, but it's new for administrators and school leaders. So we're all just kind of thrown in this together. In March, we saw uh, a complete shift, and that required a lot of um, school leaders and teachers to be more versatile and to be you know, resilient. And it's really tough to, to uh, prepare for this sort of environment when it's so new for everybody. But I would say that there are teachers who are receiving uh, support, but again, that that uh, varies on a district by district basis. And so, Dr. Bromley, let me go over to you about that question because virtual learning seems to be it, it, it is certainly a major component now of education for at least the you know our next future months um, before kids can all get back into the classroom. Um, so, what are you guys doing in terms of helping with technology needs for the schools for the parents? Yeah. So first of all, I just want to share and give a shout out to Chris. He's an amazing teacher. Uh, the state of Louisiana is fortunate to have him uh, representing us as our Teacher of the Year. And I know uh, not only has his past been exciting, but I know his future is exciting as well. And in the, in the same way uh, that we as communities lifted up uh, doctors, nurses, individuals in the medical profession uh, in the spring, and rightfully so. We need to have that same level of elevation for our teachers in our classrooms and our school leaders as we move into the school year. They are heroes. They are doing heroes work, and they're doing it in ways that we've never done this before. One of the most challenging, uh, one of the greatest challenges that we have is just the digital divide. If we have to go fully virtual, uh, we were not we were not prepared to do that in the spring. Uh, certain systems were better prepared than others, and even within systems, certain schools were better prepared than others. Uh, we've been able to push out about three hundred and sixteen million dollars uh, of money from the Federal CARES Act into our local systems. Uh, the majority of, of those dollars have been utilized for uh, the purchase of devices such as laptops and Chromebooks. Uh, also, uh, to be able to help students uh, become connected to the internet. Uh, some of that, uh, some of that funds as well, has been used for professional development for teachers to be able to teach virtually. You know, but we have we have so much to do uh, in order to prepare, uh, not just for making sure that we have the resources from the devices and the connectivity, but making sure that we know how to teach in this new way. Should we have to be all virtual for an extended period of time, which brings up another concern that I have, and I know educators across the state have. We need to make sure that across the state of Louisiana, we have high functioning internet access for every family, for every household. And we need to make sure that that is in place, not just for pre-K-12, but for higher ed, and furthermore, for individuals who are doing more remote working from home. And we need to make sure that that's universally available across our state. You know, the previous school year just ended abruptly in March, and students lost weeks of in-classroom instruction. Some schools were able to, you know, remotely make it up with their students. Other systems and schools didn't. So what is going to be done to help kids catch up? So I'm always concerned about the learning loss of children during the traditional summer. When children are out of school for two months, there is a learning loss. And so I think we're naive if we do not believe that with a, a, an elongated summer, essentially, that that learning loss is not going to be further exacerbated. And so one of the things we're going to be doing as schools come back in sessions, we're asking every system to, at a minimum, uh, conduct a diagnostic in both literacy, or reading rather, uh, and mathematics. So we're going to have a sense of where every child is. We'll be able to understand the impact of students being out of their school building since March. And, and that, that uh, asked for them to complete these diagnostics of every, of every child uh, is not just so we'll have information, but it's so we'll have information so we can then take that information and make important policy decisions or resource to ask uh, for things that we might need to, to be able to help these students get back on, on track. Patrick, um, let me ask you, I know New Schools for New Orleans really works in uh, teacher retention, teacher recruiting. Um, how do you think this whole new evolution of what's happening now, particularly with virtual instruction, how do you think that's going to impact teacher training in the future? It's, it's going to impact it um, significantly. Um, it's, it's a new way of thinking about education and doing it in mass. It's something that you know, quite honestly, you know, six months ago wasn't something that was on right. the average educator's radar. And so it's it's made us, even as an organization, we provided what we have, what we called our instructional quality initiative, 
where we've worked with um, curriculum vendors to ensure that schools were using the state-aligned tier one curriculum. And with that, we've now worked with vendors to try to change those platforms into um, virtual platforms, mm-hmm. which is extremely challenging work because it's more than just converting it to something where people can access it online. It's then how do you work through the lesson? How do you make sure that students are learning the skills? And this is it's a whole new world. And so we have to, in you know, real time, figure out how to educate students well, um, how to make certain that the educators understand how to use those platforms and then be able to measure to see if it's effective. And one thing I want to underscore too that um, Senator Brumley just mentioned is that even with technology and our organization helped raise over three three, um, quarters of a million dollars um, for offset the cost to the local school district to purchase hotspots and, and laptop devices. You think about there are families that have multiple children that are in school and families will need basically a mesh system, one where you can have better Internet signals throughout a home, which is something that more middle class and upper class families have. When you think about the poverty that our students are in and all across the state, there's even more than just having the access. It's having quality access throughout homes when you have multiple children. And so it's it's so many layers to this. There's so many layers to it. Uh, We have to make certain that we're putting people in position to understand um, all of the challenges, but then continue to put out solutions that help make the situation as, as good as possible. You know, the, the teachers are going to have to be trained in, in, you know, virtual education, but parents, too, are going to need some assistance, too, with tips on helping their kids. I mean, do you just leave a kid in front of a computer to be taught, you know, long distance like that? Or, some, or should someone be there with the child? Um, well, do you see anything like that happening in the future, too? Yeah, most definitely. Um, That's, you know, this is one of the the, the most complicated things that we've had to try to solve for real time, because in New Orleans in particular, a lot of parents work um, in service industry. They work, um, you know, just businesses all throughout the city. They have to and want to get back to work. But when you have young school age children, um, you have to have someone at home to help guide and direct them their lesson to make sure that they're on target, to make sure that if they have any technology issue, that they can help correct it. And so it's it's a catch-22. And so what we're saying right now is that there is opportunity for basically education entrepreneurs to think about what could be created and what can they create now in order to alleviate some of the challenges that we're identifying. You know, as our organization, we have limited resources, limited capability, but we do want to partner with and try to support organizations that can help mitigate some of these challenges that families are facing. Okay, we're going to have to wrap up this conversation. went by really, really quickly. I know bottom line is everybody's interested and concerned with educating our children. That is the most important thing. So um, let me start with you, Chris, and just a few closing comments. What are your concerns? What are your hopes for this school year? So some of my concerns uh, have to do with inequities that exist in education that have existed, existed long before the pandemic but have been highlighted uh, as of late. And some of my hopes is that teachers and students and parents, administrators, school leaders, uh, we go into this new year with a lot of grace and empathy and work together to try to produce the best education that we can possibly give our students, given the circumstances that we face and that we do it in a safe environment. Dr. Brumley, quickly from you. So we've been educating uh, in the same way essentially for uh, several thousand years and over a few months we're being asked to transform this, flip a switch and do it in a new way. And so that's why I think grace is important and I think it also helps expand the lift that we have in front of us. But what we have to do is make sure that our top responsibility is the safety of our students and employees and simultaneously understand that we have to find a way through innovation to educate every child in the state. Patrick, quick thought. It's us versus the virus. If we take that mentality seriously, we can fight together as a community against this virus and not pit one another, um, pit ourselves against each other. We have to figure out how to work together and collectively with empathy, with compassion and with care and understanding in order to make it through probably the most trying situation we'll see in our lifetime. Indeed. Thanks a lot, you guys, for joining us and for all the work that you're doing to, I know, educate our children to make have every child in our state have the best education possible. Dr. Cade Brumley, Patrick Dobard, Chris Deere, thanks so much. And this is a conversation we're going to have, I know, for months to come, so maybe we can talk again in the future. Thank you for joining us.
Thanks, Marcia. Well, it's something that STEM NOLA had to tackle this summer when their in-person science sessions with kids had to switch to online, virtual. WIS Outreach Manager Monica Turner asked STEM NOLA founder Dr. Calvin Mackey, who's a former university professor, if he had any tips to share about how to make the virtual learning experience most beneficial for students. Welcome, Dr. Mackey. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So many uh, teachers and, and parents feel that um, the virtual learning is uh, too much teacher-centered and not interactive. How, how, what do you feel about virtual learning in, in that respect? I believe virtual learning has potential. It's just that we have to make sure that everyone is properly trained uh, to convey the messages uh, virtually that need to be conveyed. Teachers are used to being in the classroom in front of students, and now that distance is somewhat of a challenge. What advice would you give to teachers to make their session as engaging as possible? To encourage discussion. Make sure that you can get the kids engaged in talking. Also, what you might want to do is to remember that the kids are, are detached from the, the, the normality that they're used to. So encourage group projects so that they can have time to interact with their classmates and work on something independent of, uh, of, of lecture time. Also, have the group project, have the students do the group projects and come back and present. So that'll give them some semblance of normalcy, but it also will keep them engaged. That's some tips for teachers. What are some good tips for parents? The tips to parents is to make sure that, you, that your child has an environment to learn, to make sure that you don't have a lot of noise and distractions, but also make sure that they have space. Because if the instructor is doing what he or she is supposed to be doing, then the student will be engaged in a lot of different things at one time. Do uh, parents need to be with their child while the virtual learning is going on? So I would say to parents, uh, first and foremost, uh, observe your child and see if they can handle it on their own, and then uh, eventually just back away as, as, as you feel comfortable. The challenge is when the, when the lecture and the engagement is too long and, and the kid uh, lose interest, that's when the parent needs to be able to say, look, get, get back engaged. But at the same time, the instructor uh, need to build a relationship. Just like an instructor has to know, a teacher has to know all of, of his or her kids in a classroom, nothing changes uh, virtually. One mistake that we make from the education standpoint and from the parental standpoint is that we try to, repro we try to reproduce the class day with virtual world, and, and that's, that's, not gonna, that's not going to work. Uh, the things that we found that still know that works best for us is to make sure that we can have short spurts of, uh, of lecture, you know, like explanation for 10 or 15 minutes at most, and then another five to 10 minutes of manipulatives of, uh, of the students doing something with their hands and then coming back. We have to remember that technology is just a tool. And the more tools that we can equip our, our children with, the more prepared they will be to solve the problems of the 21st century. So what the virtual learning has done is forced not only the, the, the students, but even now many parents to deal with tools that they're not even used to dealing with. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> I'm one of them. <laughs> the, the beautiful thing about virtual learning is that now students can go at their own time. Uh, one of the best practices is to make sure that whatever you're teaching, you record it and, and, and have it uh, logged somewhere where the students can access it at another time. So whether or not you know, this student is faster, or this student is slower. Uh, now we can meet students where they are because now a student can go back, look at the video again, and get it on, on their own time. Well, it sounds like you have, uh, you have the secret to get comfortable with virtual learning. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Mackey. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, and thank you all for having me. Thanks to Dr. Mackey and, of course, Monica, and also, of course, to our wonderful panel. Coming up in our next episode is going to be a look into what changes higher education is planning for instruction as we all adjust to living in the new normal, and we'll keep you posted on the date and time. Thanks for watching.